Lucinda Hules was a 17-year-old from Tampa, Florida. She had gotten married at 15 and already had two children. On October 27, 1984, Lucinda went out to a club with a couple of new friends. After midnight, the two wanted to leave, but Lucinda decided to stay. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. Do you remember the first time you discovered something wasn't real? I think for many of us, that time would be when we discovered, or were told, that Santa Claus is really just a parent at 1 a.m. on December 25th. Then, maybe if we think about it harder, we think of Mark McGuire's home runs. They weren't real. Steroids. Lance Armstrong won the Tour de France seven times. Not real. He was using HGH, or whatever it was. Millie Vanilli. Nope, they didn't sing those songs that to this day are still catchy. They lip-synced them. Rob and Fab were only out there because they looked good. And there are many well-known instances like these. And for some of you, you probably have personal stories like this as well. And we all remember how we felt when we found out. We felt foolish, sad, angry, disappointed. And in fact, at least in the English language... One of the nicest comments that can be made about a person is that he or she is real, although the definition of that could vary from person to person. I mean, the well-known CD by Faith No More, it's not called the fake thing. It's called the real thing, the one with Epic on it. Well, imagine if you're an eight-year-old girl, and your mother vanished when you were six months old, so you truly never got to know her. Then one day, out of the blue, your mother is back. Your dad is so happy to have her return, and your mother is now taking you and your brother places. And before long, it's like she never disappeared. Then you find out, your mother who came back, she isn't the real thing at all. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Goodsight, charlieproject.org. On October 27th, 1984, Lucinda left her apartment after her husband got home from work. She was headed out to the laundromat, driving the only car the family owned. Later in the evening, possibly without her husband's knowledge, Lucinda drove herself and two friends to the Charpel Lounge about 15 minutes away from where she lived. While at the club, Lucinda had a conversation with Larry Moore, someone Lucinda was interested in working for. When the two friends were ready to leave, they came to get Lucinda. However, she wasn't ready to go yet, still talking to Larry about the job. Not wanting to wait around, the women left Lucinda behind and allegedly found another way home. There is no firm evidence as to what happened to Lucinda after this time. She was never seen again. The next day, her car was found in the Charpal Lounge parking lot, where it had been the night before. The laundry folded inside. Also, two weeks later, her purse was discovered in the lost and found box at the Bush Gardens Amusement Park, which happened to be right across the street from the lounge. Employees stated it was found in a men's bathroom on their property the morning after Lucinda disappeared. Nothing was missing from the purse, and it yielded no helpful leads. The Charpal Lounge, then and now, is a shady establishment and was once portrayed in the film Goodfellas as a place where a man was abducted, then taken to the Tampa Zoo to be fed to the lions. Multiple suspects, including a serial killer, have been looked at in regards to Lucinda's disappearance, but the case remains cold. The interview for this episode is with Lucinda's daughter, Deanna Riley. And I need to give a shout out to the site crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com for making this interview possible. Unfound News. The first unfound book is in the hands of the test readers right now, and so far the responses have been very positive. In fact, one quote is, Two very enthusiastic thumbs up on your new book, Unfound, The Season 1 Cases, Volume 1. So there you go. Don't just take it from me. I hope to have it out by October 20th, but when you're a one-man show like I am, sometimes things take longer than usual. When it's posted on Amazon, 
the ebook will be $1.99 to pre order and $2.99 once it's out. Also, the Unfound Podcast website is now open. It's not fancy, it's not whiz bang, and I'm not even sure how many hits I'm going to get on it, but it's a place that can be the hub for everything Unfound does. But visit it so you can hear the secret episode that you won't hear anywhere else but on the site. Some of the comments about the secret episode so far. Great episode. I found this episode to be so informative. And loved it. Highly recommend it to everyone. And all you need to do to hear it is to enter your email address. That's it. Finally, Unfound is on Patreon. $2 a month is the entry-level tier. I'll be releasing shortly a higher level tier, probably at $5 a month, that will be connected to a blog where I will go into deep analysis on cases starting with Season 2, which began at the beginning of August. Since I don't do a lot of theorizing on this program, I'll do it there where you can copy, download it, etc., and read it on your own. In addition, Unfound now has a PayPal account if you'd like to contribute there, which may be a bit easier. I will make the Patreon benefits available to PayPal contributors as well. Where you can find Unfound on Twitter, at Unfound Podcast. We're almost to 1,000 followers there, and I've never paid for a follower. You can email the program at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. On Instagram, at Unfound Podcast. On YouTube, it's a place that I need to update very shortly. You can do a search for the Unfound Podcast channel. On Facebook, the Unfound Podcast discussion group. Unfound also has a regular page now. Please like and share. I'm going to be using it for some ads and promotions for the program. Subscribe to Unfound on Podomatic, Stitcher, Google Play, and iTunes, and you can also find Unfound on TuneIn Radio. And please mention Unfound to all your friends and neighbors, along with spreading the word on Web Sleuths, Reddit, podcasts we listen to, true crime podcasts, and all other true crime websites and forums. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the daughter of Lucinda Hules, Deanna Riley. Deanna, welcome to Unfound. Hi, thanks for having me. Deanna, this is the second time in about three weeks on Unfound where I'm interviewing a family member who really never knew the person who disappeared. A few weeks ago, uh, we did the disappearance of Helen Diamond, and it was her granddaughter, Holly, who is heading up her family's efforts to find her grandmother. Now, for you, 33 years later, you were just six months old. You never really knew your mother when she disappeared in 1984. What have you heard about your mother? Do people who know, who knew her, see similarities in you? Do you share a lot of the same traits? What have you learned about your mother over the last 30 years? Well, I knew that she was a good woman. Um, She loved uh, my brother and I, loved my dad dearly. She was a a family person. Um, She, as far as I know, you know, that's how she was very loyal and, you know, just a family person, loved her kids. Um, that's pretty much all I know as far as her, you know, well-being. Now there's other things that come across later on after come, finding out she came up missing that I know about. Mm-hmm. Does anybody say, you know, when I look at you, Deanna, uh, you look a lot like your mother. Do you? I've not met you in yes. person, but do you? Yes, very much so. Okay. Interesting. I have the dark eyes, you know, the high cheekbones like she did, um, the darker hair. Mm-hmm. It's, inter- it's interesting to see what traits are passed on, right? It's, right. Yeah. And do you, maybe as a young woman earlier in your life, did you have a lot of the same interests as your mother, what you heard about her? I mean, not, looking at it, how similar do you think you are to your mother? And what have people told you? Very, very similar. Um, She was a very clean person, as far as to my knowledge, um, the same way. I kind of OCD at times. Mm -hmm. And she was like that. Um, Even growing up a little bit in my teenage years, I was I started being a bit wild on the wild side. And that's exactly how she was up to the day she came up missing. So I have those traits as well, even 
you know, today, the age I am now, I get very bored with things very easily. And, and she was exactly like that. So definitely have a lot of traits that yeah. follow behind her. And what about your brother? Do, is he similar to her as well? Does, um, you know, we haven't um, talked, we didn't talk too much about him in our previous conversation. Maybe if you could speak for him for just a, a minute, what would you say? Yeah, he, he has some um, traits um, as far as I know, but I don't, not, I, I really don't know her. So I don't know um, as much as I know myself from hearing, you know, things how she was that kind of resemble me more. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't know. I feel like he takes more after my dad than my mom, um, in a sense. But okay. there are some things and the way, you know, of her thinking, you know, being spiritual and things like that. My brother picks up a lot on, you know, with that. So that would be something you probably would know more with speaking with him because he asks questions more for himself as I do mine. So, and your mother, when she disappeared, she was only seventeen, but she was already married. She had a couple kids. How did your mother and father meet? Um, I believe they met in the Lamplighter. Um, it's a it was a mobile home park. Uh, my grandmother moved down here from Cincinnati, Ohio, um, and she moved into this mobile home park, and they were neighbors, and they met that way through the, uh, they were neighbors, so they ended up meeting through through that, and they ended up, I guess, falling head over heels, and um, my dad later moved back up to Cincinnati, Ohio for a, a little short period of time and, and found that he wanted to come back here as well as my grandma and I guess, you know, didn't want to leave her behind. He was in, that in love. It just went mm -hmm. on from there. They got married and they had us two kids. A very young age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my mom was 15 and then when she had my brother, so... Yeah, that was fairly young. Now we come up to 1984, and you were how you were born in 84 or 83, if, if I may ask. I was born in March of 84, so and I was so, right at six months old. Six months old when she disappeared. And what was going on uh, in her life at that time, to your knowledge? Well, she. And my dad lived in an apartment complex um, in Tampa, well, Temple Terrace area, and they were married. My dad worked full-time job. She stayed home with us kids um, and did, you know, to my knowledge, what she should as a mother and wife. Um, she was into, she met a couple of friends living in that apartment complex that kind of steered her in the wrong direction. Um, and she started, you know, doing some things, dabbling and some things that she shouldn't have been, you know, even being a mom and a stay-at-home wife and stay-at-home mom. From then on, you know, it, that's when everything just started to vanish, mm -hmm. per se, herself. Um, her relationship started, you know, when I guess I'm, I'm on this thinking when they moved in that apartment complex, they started, my, her and my dad started arguing because she wanted to go out a lot and hang out with the two friends that she met in the apartment complex. And so she started going out a lot, hanging out, um, going to the bars, drinking, um, dabbling in some other things and it started arguments between, um, her, my dad and her, um, she seemed like she didn't want to do them, do those things. I mean, she did, but she would always go back and apologize to my dad, you know, write letters to him apologizing and telling him time and time and time again that she would stop going out, you know, things like that. But she just never did. She just kept doing it until, you know, the one time she went to a bar and never, you never seen her again. And you've seen those letters, haven't you? Those letters that she wrote to your, your, your dad, you have them. Yes, I have them. So this was not what happened this particular evening of your mother going out. And I know that people in general may read about your mother's disappearance and they they may think, oh, well, it's obviously this happened. And that's really not the case. 
um, that I think that we can say that regarding your father, this was not the first time that she had gone out and done this. And she had, like you said, been a very apologetic about it after the fact. Right. Okay. Yes, it wasn't the first time. She, yeah, she was, she was going out quite a bit. Hmm. And we do have to remember that she was 17. Right. And you were 17 at one time and I was 17 and we know how those uh, years can be. And then you add two children on top of it. It's not easy. Nope. It's not easy. That's, that's what, yeah, that's exactly, I think, you know, she wanted that home life, life with, you know, the family life with my dad and us two kids very much so. But she also started so young that I don't think she you know, fully got her, her teenagers out of her system. You know, she didn't get to go hang out. She didn't get to, you know, as they say, party stayed at that age and, you know, before she just settled so quickly. So it was not a surprise then that she was said she was going to go out and do laundry. And she did do laundry, but then on top of that, she went out with her friends as well. Not something that maybe at that point was unusual. Right. So what do we know, what do you know about that day, October 27th, 1984? What have you found out about it over the years? And what what did your dad tell you about it? Any police reports, anything like that? What would you find out? Um, well, I know that she was at home with my brother and I. It was just before my brother's second birthday. Um, she was actually in the mix of planning that birthday party. Um, just two weeks, um, two weeks later, November 7th would have been his second birthday party um, that she was planning. So she was planning that. She was at home with us two kids that very day. Um, she went to go do laundry. Um, then two of her friends that she did meet in that apartment complex um, asked her if she wanted to go to a bar, to my knowledge. And then so... As far as I know, she came back to the apartment and changed after she did laundry. I don't know. I mean, there's so many different scenarios to that, though. I don't know mm. which one is true. But she came back to the house and did um, change. And she even cooked dinner for my dad. He got home, um, took over me and the kids, and she went out to the bar, hung out with her friends all night, and then the two friends she went with um, were leaving. And as they were leaving, my mom was standing in the parking lot talking to um, a black male about a a company he worked for, a maid service. And I guess she was interested in being employed by him. So who are these two friends? What are their names? And what can you tell the listeners about them? Um. their names are Linda and Nika. Um, they were actually quite older than my mom. And they they weren't, I mean, at that time, they don't, they, they weren't good influences on my mom. They are the ones I believe that got her into um, the going out all the time, the drinking, the partying, you know, dabbling in some drugs here and there. And, and, and so to me, you know, maybe at their age and if there's, you know, one of them was married, so she wasn't single. So she, you know, I don't think, unless her husband was with her doing all these things, should have been doing that. To my knowledge, I don't think they had kids. So, I mean, you do what you want to do, especially at that age. They're having fun, and that's fine. But to me, you know, that wasn't good for them to be doing and dragging, you know, their supposed friend out with them that has two kids at home and a husband to take care of. So to my knowledge, I mean, I'm not saying that they were bad people or, you know, bad friends of her, but I do believe that they instigated her in doing a lot of things that she shouldn't have been doing at that time. And at least one of these women, Nika had some run-ins with the law at one time, maybe before she ever met your mother and definitely after your mother disappeared. Yeah, she has a pretty long rap sheet from from over the years, from that time and now. Um, and most of them are drugs and you know DUIs, things like that. So even up until this day, things haven't changed with her. 
by no means. And possibly at the time in 1984, at least one of these women might have been dabbling in some prostitution as well. Right. Yes. Yeah. Forgot to mention that. But yes, they were supposedly dabbling in um, prostitution. Um, The one guy at the bar actually, um, when they were there at the bar that night, um, he was questioned by one of the police officers and he actually even said that he knew those girls, you know, I guess they came into the bar frequently and they seemed to be prostitution prostitutes. And they said about my mom that she don't even look like the type of girl that should be hanging out with those two girls. She looked more of a, you know, more of an innocent type of a girl compared to those two. Yeah. I mean, she was 17 and these women, I think were at least what, 10 years older than she was probably. Maybe. Yes. And uh, if the man had lived a little harder life than your mother had to this point, so it's no wonder somebody would say that. Right, right. And what is this place? Where did your mother go with Linda and Nika that night? Uh, it was a bar in Tampa. It was called Sharpell's, actually still is called Sharpell's Lounge. Um, hole in the wall place. It was actually owned by... Um, the mob, the mobs um, back then, and I believe it still is over the years, just in, you know, generation after generation. Um, but yeah, it was just a hole in the wall. A lot of um, a lot of activity there. Um, people selling drugs. They actually just did um, a big, huge drug bust there two years ago. So it hasn't changed. <laughs> it's right here in Tampa. Worse. Right here in Tampa where you and I kind of live. I don't technically live in Tampa, neither do you, but we're on the outskirts right here in Tampa. Right, right. And was this a place that, uh, to your knowledge, your mother had gone before? Was this the first time there for her? Do you know? Um, I'm not actually a question. I don't know. I believe she had been going there before with, those two, but I'm really not sure if they, you know, they were just going to other bars or if that was the main one they went to. I'm not sure about that. Okay. And how far is this place away from where your, you and your brother and your parents were living at the time? How far? Um, I would say about 15 minutes, give, give or take about 15 minutes away. Okay, so in city traffic, maybe five miles, definitely a distance that you'd probably have to drive. And it does sound like she drove there last night and I guess maybe drove Linda and Nika there. Maybe they all went there together. Yeah, Do you know? that's what it seems like. Yeah, that's what it seems like because um, she did come home from the laundromat and change clothes, to my knowledge, from what the police reports say, um, even what my dad said. Um, not to mention she had to, you know, come home cause she had us kids and, you know, my dad was the only one when he got off work that could be there to watch us if she went out. So she came home to dinner, um, changed clothes and then drove up to the bar. Mm-hmm. And my, I'm guessing that they, I don't think they took the same vehicle because whenever they were leaving the bar, they asked my mom if she was ready, and she wasn't. So they found their way away from the bar, leaving that bar without my mom. So my guess, they didn't take the same vehicle, but they did go up at the same time. That's a good point. That's a good point. I was going to ask you about that. That's Yeah, true. True. Uh, the listeners should know that the Sharpal Lounge is essentially right across the street. And I, I've not been over in that area since I've moved to Tampa, but I looked at it on a Google map. It is, it is right across the street from Bush Gardens. Right across right. the street. Yeah. And this is probably interesting to the listeners, and I, I put this out on social media, that this Sharpel Lounge is in, it's not mentioned, but is actually one of those bars that is mentioned in the film Goodfellas, where they go down yeah. there and they take a guy that they need to get money from, like they want to take him to the camp, Tampa Zoo and feed him to the line. Well, they find him at a lounge, and this is the lounge. Yes. Yeah. And so when you said earlier that it's run by the mob, you weren't kidding. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was one of the bars that, um, to my knowledge, was that they were 
talking about in that movie in the because one of the the owner of Sarpel's owed or no the other bar down the street owed the owner at Sarpel's money and the guy came from New York and said you know you need to pay up my cousin Vinny or whatever his name is or mm-hmm. I'm going to feed you to the lions so yeah yeah something that's... along those lines anyway. Yeah, it's it's one of the few scenes in in Goodfellas that doesn't take place in New York when they go down to Florida to come down here to Florida for that. But most of the rest of the movie is takes place uh, there. So that listeners uh, might next time they see that movie, it seems like it's on TV all the time. They will think hopefully of your mother. Yeah. So uh, she stays. Those women leave somehow. They get a ride somehow. And your mother disappears. Uh, what happens next? When is the first, at what point, I guess it would be your father, does he realize that something's not right? Well, when she didn't come home all night. So that morning, um, he realized, okay, she's not home. Um, so I think his first move was to go next door to um, Mika's. Um, Linda, the two that went with her to ask to question them, you know, what happened and then, you know, where she is, where is she at? You know, he knew, he knew that she had left with them. So I think that was the first thing that he did was go next door and talk to them. Um, they told him, well, we left the bar, asked her if she was ready to go. She was standing in, in the parking lot talking to somebody about starting a job so that's the last time we see so from then on uh, my dad went to the bar to see if you know she was anywhere around if her car was there I believe that's what happened um and then her car was there left in the parking lot um laundry was still in the back seat her keys were in the car her purse was not there um the purse was found across the street at the campground Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that, nothing, sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the purse was in the campground, and um, nothing was missing out of it. She still had the change in there. I'm guessing, you know, that's what she did laundry with, and she had her marriage license in there. Um, so everything was seemed to be, you know, in there, but the purse was found by the man's bathroom of the campground. So um, I had janitor actually found it and turned it into the lost and found so yeah her car was left at the Sharpels parking lot and then her purse was found near the man's bathroom the campground across the street and when you say across the street bush gardens across the street how many feet would you say it's very close very close yeah very i'm not good with (laughs) Mm -hmm. that but i was farther than a farther than a football field but not much yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, I know that that, that is a four lane at the time, actually, I don't, it could have been actually two lane, but now I know it's mm-hmm. a four lane. So right across that literally is the campground. If you just mm-hmm. crossed over the, the street. Mm-hmm. So, and nothing unusual about the car doesn't look like she got in it and maybe somebody abducted her cars just sitting there is just like she'd parked it there the night before. Um, yeah, to my knowledge, okay. there was nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. It was just, yeah, it was just sitting there like she had parked it and left mm-hmm. it or okay. yeah, I left it. I don't know. Now, you mentioned the purse. It was technically found actually the same day that your mother disappeared, but you didn't find out about that or your dad didn't find out about that for a couple of weeks. Um, why was that? What happened there exactly? Well, um, I guess nobody had found it until the janitor um, found it and turned it into the lost and found. And then um, I believe the police was called and they took it in for evidence and then informed my dad that it was found. So although it was technically found that day you didn't realize that it was over at, they didn't realize it was over at bush gardens for two weeks because it was sitting there in the lost and found and somebody suddenly realized oh wait a minute this is the purse of that woman that disappeared right across the street a couple weeks ago right okay 
I believe so. Okay, so just trying to establish that the purse was, dis although it wasn't known to your father for a couple of weeks, it was technically discovered it was found, not, yeah. Yeah, not long after your mother disappeared. Not long, right. you know, not long, maybe within 12 hours of Linda and Nika seeing her outside. That's all we're trying to establish. Yes. Yeah. And maybe maybe we could go over again uh, what was in her purse and and to you, in your feeling was there anything missing from it? Was there any money in it? What do you th anything like that? Um, everything seemed to be in place. Um, she had. I mean, I don't obviously know exactly what was in her purse, and I don't mm -hmm. even think my dad would have known. But um, everything seemed to be in place. Um, she had change in there from, you know, just change. I know she did our clothes at the laundromat so I'm guessing that's why she had loose change um she had her marriage certificate why she was carrying that around with her I have no idea mm. but she did have that in there um she had her ID um and um I believe she had her um I think it was an insurance card or a dental card something like that in there as well so everything seemed to be in place Okay, and it was found in the men's restroom. It was like sitting under a bench in there or something like that. Yeah, well, I believe it was. I don't. I don't think it was in actually in the men's restroom. But yeah, there was a bench right there next to the men's bathroom, and that's where it was found. Uh, was Larry Moore, who is the guy that was talking to your mother last night, at least according to Linda and Nika, was he questioned about? Uh, that night, what did he have to say? Was he thinking about hiring her for this business that he had? And what kind of business w was he in? Yeah, Larry Moore was um, the guy she was speaking with, uh, you know, when Linda and Nika, as they say, whenever they left the bar, she was standing there speaking with him, Larry Moore. Um, he owned a maid, a maid service company a cleaning service and um i guess he had offered my mom a job so that was what they were talking about in the parking lot you know when to start or if she has any experience things like that to my knowledge um he also owned a roofing company um a roofing company a cleaning service and i believe a sign company so it um, seemed like he had a couple different businesses um they did question him um, they pulled him over, him and another guy, they pulled over, they um, had a weapon in their car with several rounds, um, some of them laying on the floorboard um, that go to that con that weapon. Um, but they were questioned. Um, they said that whenever my mom, they last seen my mom, they were inside the bar. So that was, that seemed odd to me because, you know, her two friends, Linda and Nika, said that last they seen her, she was outside the bar talking to him. Well, his report, police report that I have on file says that he said that he was inside the bar when my mom, he seen my mom leave. So that was odd. And so that's what they told the police. They, they, uh, the police um, asked if they would do a lie detector test. They didn't deny that. They said they would. As far as my knowledge, they didn't take a lie detector test, polygraph. I'm not sure because I've never seen it in my reports. I've never seen or heard anybody talk about it. So, And it should be established that you do have a lot of paperwork regarding your mother's disappearance. You've gotten a lot of it. Yes, I have stacks and stacks of reports. I mean, all kinds of different reports. Some could be bogus. Some, you know, could be true. That's what trying to figure out now you know cause yeah sure but in none of that does it say that that larry moore or this other guy that was with him that night that they took a polygraph test and it surely does not say whether they passed it or not right none of that says okay. anywhere in there my dad never i've even asked my dad over the years and he has no idea of whatever came out of that if they ended up taking one or not but they did um they did get taken into the police station. I know that I even have their mug shots, um, but it's so blacked out. You can see their profile, but you can't see nothing else. It's so blacked up. I don't know if it's from you know just the 
back then it, the cameras were older or just making copies. I'm not sure, but they did get taken in um, and questioned and everything. So they, and that was it. That was the last of them. Mm-hmm. I think more should have, you know, came out of that because her two friends were saying that she was last seen with him. So I think that maybe they should have did a polygraph test or, you know, let us know if they took one or not. Of course. The of it. Sure. Sure. And what's noteworthy is you mentioned that they got pulled over by police. That was the exact same night that your mother disappeared. And I guess drugs were found in, in the car as well when these two yeah. got pulled over. And I, I, unfortunately, I did not write down the other guy's name, but it was Larry Moore that uh, Nika and Linda specifically picked out that they saw Lu- your mother, Lucinda, with that night. And so that's why right. the, he, we've used his name. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what else have you learned about Larry Moore over the years? Any anything um, suspicious? Has he had any other run-ins with the law? To your once again, to your knowledge, any ideas? No, I haven't. To my knowledge, no. Um, I've tried to research him a few times. He's not really even as of a couple of weeks ago. I tried to pull him up and. Nothing's even showing up. I mean, there's a couple of obituaries that are showing up, but I don't even know if those actually, you know, because they're not saying, you know, exactly. They're saying his name, but there's so many different ones. So I don't know if one of them's him or not. So I don't, but I know he would be pretty old to this day. So he might be deceased. But over the years, no, I don't, as far as my knowledge, I haven't heard anything. I haven't really tried to look him up either. Um. I really yeah, I mean, he, he he might have been in his 30s, maybe at this time. I mean, and that yeah, he, he'd 19, be in his mid to late 60s yeah. now. He'd be mid, mid late 60s. Oh yeah, I think he would actually be older than that now. I think he's like 78 now. Oh wow, he then was, he would have been in his yeah, 40s. He was, he was older. Yes, he was way older even than Linda and Nika. And he, I mind you, he had three running three businesses and you know things like that. So he was he's quite older. Yeah. Um, I think I do have his birthday um, written down somewhere, but yeah, I, I do remember he was he was an older guy. And we should say one more thing is that there was the suspicious suspicion out there that this one particular business that he had the main cl- made cleaning service might not have been that. Um, it may not, it might, it could have been a prostitution, you know, just a cover up to, for prostitution. Um, I heard that. I don't know how much of that is true, but yes, you know, there's some things that I've heard over the years or, you know, something I read even in the prostitute. Um, I will say that, um, there was one report in there that some, some guy had made a report to the police station that some woman named Ann Masters knocked at his door asking for work if he has any, you know, extra things he could do either around the house, yard work, things like that, roofing work. And it mentioned roofing work as well. Um, and he, he told her no and asked her, you know, where are you, where do you live or where are you from? And she pointed right down the street from his house. And he said that house has a lot of traffic in and out, a bunch of young people living there. And then later on, he he realized that he saw my mom's picture on the news, missing person, and later called the police station and made that report saying this woman of Ann Masters looks just like Lucinda. I just saw her on TV and she came to my door asking for work. So that was one of the re- reports. And this uh-huh. was, this was, um, she came up missing in 1984 in October. And this was in February that the guy made the next, you know, the next couple months, February, that he made that report. So five months later. Huh. And how close would this have been to maybe where you grew up or where you li- your family lived at the time or how close was this to the lounge how close was this to bush gardens was it, was it all in that general area it was in the general area i'm not sure exactly where but i know the city was tampa so um i do have the name of the street and address but i don't know exactly where it was located i did i google it 
years and years and years ago, but I don't know how far from where we lived at the time or the bar. But I do know it's in the general area from where she came up missing. Okay. Uh, to your knowledge, uh, did Larry Moore happen to live in that area or did he live closer to the lounge? Is it possible that that place that this guy was made this report on, could that have been Larry Moore's place? Is it possible? It's very possible. Um, I know Larry did live in the general area too. I don't know his address exactly at that time, but it's very possible that could have been it. And if not his address, it could have been where he, you know, ran his business out of his three businesses or even just the maid service. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, there's so many, you know, different, I don't know. I, I really don't know. A lot of different possibilities. And we, we yeah. don't even know if that was actually your mother at that door that day or not. We just don't know. Right. We, we just, just don't, don't know. There's just a lot of possibilities, uh, a lot of unanswered questions in this case, of course. So what happened after that? You uh, Obviously, you had this report five months later. Maybe somebody saw your mother. But other than that, did the police get any other leads? Her Her purse was found a couple weeks later. But other than that, the rest of the 1980s, to your knowledge, I know once again, you're just a little girl, uh, any leads at all, was it anything, anything popped up, anything oh, found? Was, yeah, there was several over the, over the years, um, even up until, oh, um, I don't, probably even up until like the early 2000s, I don't. I'm trying to think that last, well, no, maybe not that, back to 1990s There's from 1984 till 19, early 1990s, there was, you know, leads popping up all over the place. Um, I know there was one that the truck driver, um, this girl was hitchhiking and, um, he was traveling, he was a truck driver and, she asked at a rest area, he was stopped at a rest area and she asked for a ride and that was in Tennessee. And he reported that she looked just like the missing woman, Lucinda. So that was one report. There was another bogus, I think it's bogus. I mean, they even checked it out and it was bogus, but there was a report made that um, one of this, this, this girl, she, she had, she had mental issues. Um, but she was reporting that my mom, not my mom, but some girl, some woman her age, you know, was being held in a basement or something like that. Um, but then she later admitted that it wasn't true. So there was a bunch of different, but there was a report saying that the girl looked just like my mom and that was in another state as well. So I don't know, but that they ended up finding that the girl had mental in it, um, issues and I don't know I don't know there they came to a dead end on that one too but nothing really any leads that really m moved the case forward at all except for the purse being found and possibly this other guy in uh, the Tampa area who might have seen your mother came up to his door just not a lot of leads that went anywhere yep they know okay. there's I mean, there's, I got quite a few reports and people saying that they've seen her here and there, but they've not, yeah, they never went anywhere. They, they were all um, investigated and nothing came out of them. Okay. Let's move up to 1992. Uh, it's eight years later and uh, the listeners are going to find out very shortly. This is a, a very bizarre, not just for this case, but for any sort of disappearance case. What happened in 1992? Um, well, I was eight years old at that time. Um, my brother was almost 10. Um, well, he was 10. I don't know how it is now. <laughs> um, we were young. We were eight and 10 years old, and we lived with my granny at the time in Lakeland. Um, my dad, my brother, and I lived with her. My dad worked full time, so you know he had help with my with both sides of my grandparents. So we were living with her at the time, and we get a phone call out of the blue, 
and I actually answered the phone and it was a lady and she said, um, who is this? And I said, well, either I said that or she said, I, oh yeah, she said that. And I said, it's Nana. And she said, oh my gosh, it's my baby girl. Um, this is your mom. And I kind of just said, no, don't quit playing. You know, I was young. I didn't really think nothing of it. I just thought someone was pulling a prank or something. And my granny overheard me and snatched the phone from me. And they just started having a conversation. It turned out it was my mom. Um, this lady, anyway, from Arkansas, um, claiming to be my mom. And before we knew it, my dad and my my two aunts, her two sisters, went up to Arkansas and picked this lady up. And she was our mom. She came home and lived with us. And we had our mom back. And then, so um, w- w- let me ask you this: When she, this woman, um, who we could just give away, was impersonating your mother, she did look a lot like her. In the and I'm going to po- we've posted pictures uh, of her, uh, so people can make a comparison. Uh, what did you think when uh, this woman uh, walked in the door and you saw her? Do you remember? You're eight years old. Do you remember? I do remember. Like it was just say I was happy i ran up to her i remember me and my brother both just ran up to her and just happy and i'm like tear like crying of joy like we had our mom back my dad was happy the whole family was just just very happy she did look a lot like my mom um and mind you it was eight years later so maybe a little things have changed but she was a woman now not a teenager she would have been 26 at the time you know, that she came back, not 17. So, yeah, she developed and, you know, looked more womanly. But, yeah, for the most part, she looked just like her. And she knew all kinds of things about our family. She knew which sister was which. Whenever they went up to Arkansas, she was, you know, oh, she went to, oh, so much. And she went to my Aunt B, which is her name's Brenda. So she knew everybody. Um, so, yeah. It, we thought it was her, and we were happy. Did did every did was there any suspicion at the time expressed by anybody in your family that this woman wasn't who she said she was? Um, not to my. I mean, it's hard to remember. And, and mm. mind you, too, they didn't share a lot with us kids. We were so young, so mm. even if there was a suspicion at that time, they didn't share it with us. Um, but as far as I know, everybody was happy. She was home. Um, there is one person that had a suspicion, which was her best friend, Candy, at the time, um, in 1984. Her and my dad were best friends with Candy, and she she saw her. Actually, um, my mom, I guess, I guess, noticed her in a grocery store and noticed it was her somehow. I don't know if she just saw pictures or how she knew it was Candy, but she knew it was her friend. But Candy didn't think it was her. She she thought there was something odd, something just wasn't right, but she never mentioned anything to the family. She just thinks she saw us so happy. My dad was so happy again, and she didn't know for a fact that it wasn't her. So she just, she just kind of kept that to herself to avoid, you know, any complication or anybody getting hurt. And she was just going to let it play out and see how everything went. But she's the only one, to my knowledge, that, you know, thought immediately that something wasn't right. And what kind of mother was she for that time that she was in your house? um, This woman's name is Amanda. How did she treat you? Uh, Very good. Very good. Uh, From what I can remember, I mean... She, we we went to a mother daughter banquet at the church together. Um, she helped my granny, her mom, make a dress for us to go to the mother because my granny made dresses and stuff back then. So she made dresses with my granny. Those are that's what we wore to the mother daughter banquet. Where um, she was, she was good. She was a mom. She seemed like a good one at that. Um, she very intensive to my dad she bought him cards all the time um very you know 
intimate with him. Um, just seemed like a good person. She brought a cat with her. Like, she had, I guess she owned this cat at the time named Gizmo. She brought that with her. And, like, you know, like, it was no big deal. You know, it's like her pet, and, you know, it ended up being our pet. So, actually, till years later after, you know, she vanished again. <laughs> and during this time uh, that she was your mother and your dad thought that she was his wife, uh, did any of those old friends ever come around, those people who were around when she disappeared in 1984? Did Nika or Linda... Larry Moore, any of these people who might have been around your mother that night that she disappeared, did they ever come around to say, hey, you're back, what happened? Any of them, ever, any call, any letters, anything? No, not at all, not one of them. I mean, and it was broadcasted on the news, on, you know, missing woman after eight years, returns home to her family. I mean, it, so they, they had to have known she came back. So, yeah, not one of them called and said oh you know how are you what happened nothing like that not one of them the only one was candy which was my mom and dad's best friend you know for years she's the only one that was around um that seemed like she even you know that she cared but not one of the two that were at the apartment complex or very you know so how long did this go on deanna how long did this um her pretending to be your mother went on and uh was it somebody was it you was it your dad who finally maybe kind of figured it out or did somebody come in from the outside and you know just show up one day and said you know what this isn't she isn't who she said she is she was well i thought in my head because i'm young like i said my family they weren't going to share a lot with us because we were so young so I was, you know, in my head, I'm thinking she was always there for a, right up to a year, you know, but she was, she was there, but she, she wasn't there, but they just kept telling us, you know, she's visiting friends, things like that. But for, she was there before anybody for I mean, four to six months, I would, I would something like that. Um, and then her aunt and uncle, there was a, male and female that came down from Arkansas to the police station and said that the missing woman was Sunday Hills that just returned back to her family is not who she said she is. She's our 17 year old runaway niece and we're here to pick her up. So they picked her up or, you know, actually didn't pick her up right away. They, contacted my dad of course and they went to the police station and um just started questioning her and she admitted to what she did i believe but before all that um she no i don't i don't think she did admit because no she didn't admit her aunt and uncle were there they went for questioning and then, because my mom was there living with us still, and then, because we were doing blood testing, I remember going to get blood test work done, and then all this stuff started happening around our house. Um, so, one time we were scheduled to go get blood testing, and my mom had went out to get my dad a birthday card one night, and all of a sudden the police the police call and my dad your wife has been in a pretty bad car accident right down the road from where we live and she was flipped upside down in a ditch and she had said that someone in a white van ran her off the road she didn't she only had a couple cuts on her bruises that's it um and that was one we had to reschedule that blood testing that was for the next day um then another right before it seemed like the next blood testing we we did we, we got all kinds of vandalism around our house. Someone wrote strike one on the wrecked car, strike two on our shed, and there was no strike three. All the tires on all the vehicles were popped. So all that stuff started happening around the same time, you know, the blood testing. So we finally got the blood work done, and she, it didn't match my brother and I. It wasn't her. It wasn't our mom. 
and the Ooh. aunt and uncle had come down and um, said that she was their 17-year-old runaway niece, mm-hmm. and she was looking for a new life. She wasn't happy in her life. She saw our story on Unsolved Mysteries, and she went to the police station, claimed to be her, and she wanted to come back home to her family, and so that's that's where she came so all those things you're thinking, I think the listeners will believe it as well, where the, the car wreck and the vandalism was just an effort to delay the blood test that would eventually prove that she wasn't who she wasn't who she said yeah. she was. Right. That's exactly what happened. Okay. Did, yeah, um, did Amanda at, at any point after this uh, explain why she did? I like I know she said she wanted had to get away. But, um, you know, anything past anything in addition to that and anything like that? Um, I'm not sure. I do know that when she was living in Arkansas, she was only 17. Her name was Amanda. She was actually married to a guy as well. And I guess she wasn't happy in that marriage. So she told the guy, you know, I have something to confess to you because they saw, you know, I guess the guy even, you know, was watching the show with her and he said, you look a lot like that woman. And, um, she said, yeah, I got to confess to you. I've been living a lie. That's me. So they turned her husband actually turned her into the police station and she decided that she wanted to come down here and try to make it work with us again. So they took her in for questioning and, She actually had the same scar on her leg my mom did. She looked just like her. She knew information about my family. Um, The only thing that she didn't have the same that my mom is the gap between her teeth. And she said that she had gotten into a car accident. And so she had the dental work done to fix that. So Hmm. that was, you know, her life before us was she was married young and you know, just to me, it's crazy. <laughs> Did she ever give an explanation to your father what happened in those eight years? You know, I mean, what was her cover story? I guess you'd call it. Was it amnesia? Did she feel, you know, she felt like know. she needed? Did are, are you aware of that? Did your dad ever tell you that anything like that? Yeah, but as far as I know, and he, I don't. I mean, he vaguely told me he really didn't tell me because I mean he told me but I also read reports but supposedly she you know just was young she ran away and she just wanted a, a new life because she was young with us at the time and felt like she didn't get to live before she settled so quickly you know with us kids and being married so supposedly she she said she just ran away from us and started a whole new life, and and hmm. that was that was the reasoning, as far as I know. How was that for you? I mean, was it uh, frankly was it like losing your mother again? Oh yeah, it was bad. Um, I remember coming home from school one day, and like I said, my mom, you know, she was there again, but the last few months she just wasn't there with us and they kept telling us you know she's fine she's just visiting some friends she hasn't seen in a while and you know she's fine so they weren't telling us right away but you know we kind of knew something wasn't right because she just wasn't there the last couple months anymore and so finally one day they just me and me and my brother got home from school and my dad was off work my whole family was sitting around the kitchen table and they look sad, and um, I remember my brother get, jumping on my granny's lap. I got on my dad's lap, and they just kind of broke it to us and said that she wasn't our mom. And I just remember I was crying and saying that's not true, and my brother, you know, getting upset, and everybody just, it was sad. It was a sad day. My dad, after that, wasn't the same. He was depressed all the time and up until the day he passed away he 
wasn't the same anymore. Didn't want to talk about it. No, he didn't. He, yeah, it didn't seem like it. He, I think he was trying to get over it, but never did. I think he just took it to the grave with him, to be honest. After Amanda, uh, I guess, went back to Arkansas, did your dad ever get married again or anything? Never. He never moved on. And he was a good man. And, you know, worked, worked hard. He was a good father. He owned his own business. You know, he did good for himself, and he just moved on. And he's not with us anymore, is he? No, he passed away. At, um, he had a severe stroke. Actually, Sunday will be seven years. Help this come, this uh, this episode will be coming out on October thirteenth, two thousand seventeen. So, uh, October fifteenth will be seven years since he passed away. Yes. Okay. Since Amanda went back to Arkansas, ever hear anything from her? She ever send you apology? And as for any of these other people that are kind of connected to your mother's disappearance, Linda, Nika, Larry Moore, ever hear from any of them in the last so many years? Yeah. Um, Amanda... We con actually we did a a um a news story last year around this time actually um we did a for Fox thirteen um the local news station here in Tampa they did a episode with us for um on the news and the reporter actually found Amanda and asked her if she would do an interview um that we were doing a story about what happened and she denied it. But we were able to talk to her on Facebook. Um, so, yeah, she's, she's actually on my Facebook to this day, and we communicate. She said she still has something, a couple things that my mom, um, I believe one thing is a bracelet that my mom had made, you know, back then. She has a couple pictures, and she wants to send them to us, the mail. She also said she had a couple things she wanted to share with us. And my brother and I, we just haven't been able to coordinate a you know, good time. We're all together to talk about it. So, and, But this would have been the first time that you communicated with her since 1992, 1993. First time, like 20-some years. First time. And we should make clear on something, just to say this for record. Uh, you do not believe that Amanda or anybody connected to her had anything to do, to do with your mother's disappearance, just to be clear. No, I, mean, I know Amanda for sure is not her. Even you know now looking at her Facebook, you know she has a lot of family pictures when she was younger, and so I do know that she's definitely not her now. You know, if per se my mom's still alive somewhere out there, you know, would she have known her? You know, somehow did they run into each other, and maybe, maybe that you know. Maybe that's how she knew all the information she knew about my family when she came in to, you know, mm. be a uh, one of the imposter. Maybe she found, I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no clue. But do, is she her? No, she's definitely not her. And maybe we kind of glossed over this when we talked about uh, Amanda coming into your life in 1992. Although your perception was that she was into her 20s, maybe your dad's, the other family members. She was only the same age your mother was when she disappeared in 1984, which was coincidentally 17. Yes. She was 17, yeah, when she arrived here as my mom, and my mom would have been 26 at the time. And my mom also was 17 when she disappeared, yeah. And so back in 1984, Amanda would have only been nine years old or something at the time that your mother disappeared. So once again, it's a little hard to comprehend, but you may have been right. Maybe in that time there was some interaction. And I suppose that's something that you could ask uh, Amanda about if you ever get the opportunity to do that uh, again. But um, I'm I'm sure some listeners are thinking, well, it's, it's kind of strange to reconnect with somebody like that all these years later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, 
nerve wracking. Um, I, it was hard to even write her for the first time and even get out what I want to say clearly because I didn't know how to approach it. Like, do I approach it angry, like mad at her for doing that to my family? Do I, you know, just approach her in a nice way, you know, forgiving way? I mean, even to this day, it's, you know, people say, how how can you be so like nice about it or you know when you talk about her it's not that I am it's just that you know things happen she was young you know I'm a forgiving person um there are things that she has told me as to you know why she did it um so I don't know I just feel like you know she was she had mental problems but yeah and but like you said um, yeah, while she, she was there she, she was a good she was a good mother to you even though she wasn't yeah, your mom. She, yeah, she didn't hurt us at all when she was here, you know, and obviously it affected her too in some way, you know, even after the fact because she had she had a daughter and she named her daughter Katrina Renee, which Katrina is the name of her sister and Renee is my middle name. So if you're going to name your daughter after that, somehow still connected in a way with us huh. or you feel bad. I don't know what her reasoning was behind that but there's also you know I want to still keep her you know on Facebook because I still want to find out things I still have questions I still have you know things I want to talk to her about and as she said you know she wants to talk to things you know about to sure. us about things so yeah um so just to be clear Katrina is the name of your mother's sister Katrina yes so that's she. So Amanda named her daughter Katrina, which is your uh, mother's sister's name, and then Renee, which is your middle name. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And I. And that's another question I want to ask her. You know, why did she do that? Like, does she still feel emotionally attached to us in some way? Like that time that she was here, I feel like she really generally got close with us and fell in love with us as a family. Like I. To me, she just seemed very sincere when she was here. Like, so maybe it just touched her life, and she wanted to continue that through her daughter. I don't know. It's yeah. a question that I would love to ask her. And I and I and I hope you will. And I'm not saying you have to tell me, or I mean, just for your own knowledge, you don't surely do not have to tell me what her answer is in all these other conversations that I hope you do have with. I think that's very important. But I hope mm -hmm. you I hope you get the answers you're looking for when you do talk to her. Yeah. I hope you do. Now I know that um several people I'm sure are gonna come across or over the years have come across your uh, mother's disappearance, maybe on websleuths.com or charlieproject.org or any of the missing person sites out there. And they're they're going to look at your father right away. They're gonna look at here was a woman who was 17. She said she was going to go do the laundry, but she went out with her friends instead. And some of these friends are shady. And I mean, and there are a lot of cases like that where absolutely the, the husband, uh, the ex-husband, the boyfriend, ex-boyfriend are involved in a disappearance. But in your father's case, what would you say uh, the chances are, and maybe those facts out there, that, that, that don't make him actually a very good suspect at all in this disappearance? Yeah, I I mean I see it all over mm -hmm. the websites and people you making their own accusations about it, but definitely not. My dad was a very good man. He was caring, loyal, loving. He would do anything for anybody. Um, he, yes, I mean they argued at the time because she was going out a lot and she wasn't staying home, you know, as a family that he you know wanted for us kids and himself, but he always forgave her like always forgave her when she wrote letters or told him face to face like he was he, he loved her he was very much in love with her and um even to the day he died like he just loved her he, he'd get teary-eyed even talking about her he never moved on so i just i don't i I never would look at it like that um not to mention the night that she came up and when she went to the bar you know, he didn't have, they shared one car, so he didn't have the vehicle. She had it at the bar, and he was there at home with us kids. 
so and the police did question um other people in the apartment complex was he there all night with the kids and and he was so that was you know and not to mention like, that and not to mention that you you did not live anywhere near them I mean, it's 15 minute drive if he had to walk it or even if he took the bus it's gonna be an hour or something like that you know to go all that way and yeah. it's hard to imagine him walking all the way down there doing whatever he right. might have done and then come back it's just it's hard to imagine yeah and my dad also actually my mom and him as well they they were very picky about who they let watch my brother and I like they don't I mean I my aunt her mom Katrina or I'm sorry her sister Katrina my aunt she always told me too that they were always picky about who they let watch us so in order for my dad to even walk down there or drive somehow he would have to leave with somebody and the only people would have been my one of my grandparents or my aunt so and of course they didn't have us he did so mm. and they you know would tell you that so. so it may be that maybe your your father was maybe a little disgusted with what your mother was doing but really just nowhere in the area to do that and there's nobody has ever said that your father ever borrowed somebody's car or anything like that i mean it's just nobody not, nobody yeah okay no. okay you happen to believe uh, you can talk about this now that pro that you think that linda and or nika maybe know a little bit more about this disappearance than and then than they've said um nika as we said earlier has had a colorful criminal history since then for decades now um have you been able to track her down and talk to her or try to talk to linda you know has she had run-ins with the law what can you tell the listeners a little bit more about them and uh, your suspicions or any kind of uh, ways you've tried to contact them well linda i'm still i still haven't found um still kind of working on that nika is in jail as we speak as far as i know um i would love to contact her somehow or even visit her at the jail <laughs> uh -huh. i mean i don't know if she would she'd probably deny my visitation not or i could write her a letter and tell her and then visit and ask questions you know i would love to do that but um as far as i know she is in jail um do i think they know something yes part of me does because and the rep the police reports that I have from each one of them, they both say something different. Um, and I'd have to have them actually right in front of me. I, it's fine. I mean, I go, but they each say something totally different as to what happened that night. I mean, it's not off too, it's not off too much of what the police reports say, but it is different. And they were quite older than my mom. Um, there are um, people that were witnessed from that night that said that they were into prostitution um not to mention eight years later when amanda came and posed as my mom they never if they were her true friends or if they you know cared even just a little bit they would have acknowledged that okay wow she's back eight years later she's okay like let's find out what happened you know they didn't even do that so either they're just carry on with their lives still drunk and prostitution and doing drugs apparently she's still in jail nika is so maybe maybe that's the reason why they didn't care because they're still living that lifestyle or they know something and they didn't want to get involved i don't know what if okay my mom got murdered and they witnessed it or they knew something more than what happened and they knew that amanda wasn't my mom so that's why they didn't care to come and find out what happened so i don't know there's different possibilities Yes, there are. And just to reiterate this, and I know you wouldn't personally know, being that you were only six months old, but after your mother disappeared, uh, did they ever, did your dad ever say anything or, or anybody else in your family, old, people who had been old enough to know, did those two women ever come over to your apartment or anything, express condolences, express concern, did they volunteer to go on a search, anything like that, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. And I've never even questioned that. So I'm really, yeah, I'm really not sure. Yeah, my my impression would be something like that would probably come up at least once or twice. I think that 
maybe they w- that would have been mentioned to you that, you know, well, you know what, a couple days after, maybe your dad would have said something to you or somebody else. Yeah. That you know what, you know what, those two women that were with Lucinda that night, they did come over and they were very concerned. They sat here for an hour and we talked about what went on that night. You've never heard yeah. any stories like that. No. And I also know too that, you know, they didn't know my mom very long. And I even, I even double checked that, um, just the other day I asked my aunt, um, they didn't know her. My mom only met them in that apartment complex when she moved there. So they didn't know each other that long. They just met in the apartment complex and everything went downhill from there. One more question about all of them, then we're going to move on to something else. But uh, to your knowledge, did Linda and Nika know Larry Moore? Be, you know, before that night, were they friends as well? Or they were they complete strangers that night? Or maybe they just knew him. To from, my knowledge, uh, they knew they knew him. From my not to my knowledge, um, I believe they did. Yeah, and I know actually Linda's her husband knew him. So yeah, they knew him. And Linda and her husband fought. Actually, they got into an argument that night at the bar. Um, and I remember reading somewhere in those reports that them two knew each other. So. Okay. So Linda was married. Linda's husband was yeah, there that Linda. night. Linda's yeah. husband was there that night as well. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Now, in some of the reading that I'm sure that some of the listeners are going to do, looking up your mother's case, uh, there was a serial killer in the Tampa area. His name was Bobby Joe Long. Have you ever heard the police mention him? Uh, anything that you know about that? Any possibility that he could have run into your mother that night? Either way, any feelings about that? There's a good possibility. And for a long time, we, you know, thought of him as one, you know, one of the possibilities as a suspect because, you know, back then he, he was, Bobby DeLong was a rapist, the killer, you know, he went around the whole Tampa Bay area doing so. So we definitely thought maybe he was one that got a hold of my mom, but then, Last year, when we did the the news um, the news story on the Fox 13 News, the reporter actually got a hold of him and and reached out to him and asked him, "Was he involved in my mom's disappearance? Did he was was she one of his victims?" And he actually and he's still you know incarcerated in prison, um, and he said no. I, she was not one of my suspects, and I have changed since then. Um, I'm so sorry for what happened to her. Your family, I'm sorry that you guys are going through it. I mean, he was actually quite sincere. Um, do I have sympathy for him? No, because he did rape and kill a lot of females, so I don't have sympathy. But, yeah, he did say, I'm sorry for what her fam- what your family said their family talking to the reporter is going through, but no, she is not. She was not one of my victims. So, I mean, I don't see him having anything to lose. He's in prison for life on death row. So if he would have admitted to it, he, it's not like he has anything to lose, you know, what he, he's already, he's already on death row. So I, I kind of, I, I do believe him in a way for that reason. I believe there was a book written about him as well. Um, or that could have been Ted Bundy, but yeah, back in the eighties, he was, he was pretty well known back then. He, he has quite a rap sheet, a list of murders that he convicted. So. Uh, was he ever known to being in the area of the Sharpell lounge? Any story out there that he, he had ever, ever gone there to your, to your... Uh, I'm not to my, not, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Don't have okay. A answer to okay. I'm just, I'm just wondering, just wondering if, uh, you ever lived in the area or anybody, anytime had ever seen him. I'm just wondering where his hangouts were. And I'm also wondering, you know, how he might've met these women, you know, that he ended up killing. And I'm going to probably have to do a little more research on that uh, about yeah. him. Yeah. I mean, I, he was from the area I'm assuming, but I mean, hmm. 
mean, there's I, this is questions that I'm even now asking myself. I should look up and find <laughs> out those things. <laughs> okay. Something that's never even crossed my head to, you know, research on. Because what if he did know, say he knew Larry, Larry at the time or, you know, what if he knew somebody in those crowds? You never know. But I think, too, at the time, I'm wanting... I don't know if he was already arrested or I don't know. I'm going to have to look all that up too. Cause I don't know if he, I mean, obviously for us to think or even the reporters to even think of him as a suspect, he wasn't arrested yet. Unless would, he was arrested and got back out. So I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't know. Yeah. Usually when they start breaking that stuff down, the police do and finally catch you know, a serial killer, they usually work their way backwards trying to figure out what he, where he was at various times, try to connect him to other maybe unsolved disappearances, right. unsolved murders. And it may be somewhere in there you may find that he might have been out of state at the time your mother disappeared. It just, mm-hmm. just don't, just don't know. And I'm sure there's going to be at least a few listeners who are going to look that up for themselves and probably get back to me on that. I do I'm, know that they did question him back then. They did question him. So that's in the report too, one of the reports, but they did question him and he denied it. So So they looked at him in nineteen eighty four is what you're saying. Yes. There is okay. um I do remember seeing that in the police report. And then here, you know, just of last year the reporter um mm-hmm. asked him as well. And okay. he wrote a letter back to her saying that he did not she was not one of his victims. Okay. So it's been 33 years, Deanna. Um, you're, you are a mother now. You're married. Uh, what's it been like for you? Um, well, I'm, I, now I'm happy. Yeah, I'm really, I'm happy. I have two beautiful kids. Life is good, um, but every day is still, you know, a question in my head. My brother, my family said, you know, like, we're still wanting closure. Um, it's still about my brother, you know, he's got a lot of issues, shit, anxiety, things like that, as do I, as do, you know, a few other people in my family. And I don't know. And it's, and I, I don't blame that just on her, you know, I, I just blame it on the whole situation. Like even, okay, she came up missing in 1984, but then we regained our mother and lost her again. And we were lied to. We were, you know, I have problems with, abandonment issues like I'm I'm scared I'm gonna get left even in relationships I'm you know I cling on to what I have so hard because I feel like I've lost so much and she lied to us she posed as someone she wasn't she abandoned us again you know so there's a lot of issues deep down that we deal with on a daily basis um so yeah it would be good to have closure um, even I hate to say this, but and I would hate to find her murdered or body somewhere, but it would still be a part of closure, you know. You know. And then we can still, yeah, and then we can still try to at least we would have evidence. Maybe we would find out, you know, who did it, or you know, and have closure that way. Do you think about her a lot? You think your mother about your mother a lot? Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, even things that I, the traits that I've taken up that I know she had makes me makes her pop in my head all the time because I remember my aunt telling me or my granny or my dad, your mom would do the exact same thing or, you know, you're just like your mom. Even, you know, with my attitude, I'm very stubborn and hard headed and, you know, busy body. I'm always cleaning things like that. You know, that's Mm -hmm. just how she was. So they're always telling me, even if I'm not thinking of her, someone's always saying you're like your mom and you're just like your mom. So she's definitely there quite often. Yeah. Where can uh, the listeners find um, information on your mother, her disappearance, any of that? Of course, we got introduced uh, by uh, a blogger. Uh, I just know, you know, we'll just name his Give his first name Anthony. Uh, he likes to keep his his entire name uh, secret, which I totally appreciate, and I deeply right. appreciate him and his blog uh, introducing us. And he does done extensive work, 
you know, getting, yeah. you know, information out there about your mother's disappearance. He's doing nice work there. Um, but anywhere else, do you have a Facebook page, anything like that? Um, I don't have, yeah, I don't have a, um, Facebook page solely on her, but I mean, you can just simply Google her name and mm-hmm. she will pop up all over the place. That's all, you know, that's, that's the true. Best way I could tell you. That's true. I mean, she's on the Charlie project. She's on all kinds of different, you know, websites that people have, you know, the missing person website. So. Okay. Yeah, I would just Google her name and she there she is. I mean, you can't miss it. There's there's quite a few pages that, you know, that she's on different websites. So. Yeah, you're right. That's and listeners, I can tell you that's that's true. I'm probably gonna be directing people probably mostly toward um his site. And uh, because like I said, the I think the most information as far as to read is right there. You know, right. so that's where yeah. I'm going to be pointing people. And I know that you have a really good relationship uh, with the blogger that we both know. Yeah. Uh, any last words, Deanna, before we conclude this interview? Um, no, I just hope that if anybody hears this or has any information, to please contact um, somebody and um, and don't ever be scared to, don't ever think that, you know, you're going to get someone in trouble or, you know, something, anything, just don't ever hesitate. If you have any information. Um, and I just hope that, I hope this does find us closure and, and I appreciate everything that you've done for me and, um, Anthony as well. You guys have done a great job and I hope something comes out of it but if not i'm very thankful and i appreciate the time that you took to talk with me you're welcome deanna and i appreciate you being on this episode of unfound okay thank you you're welcome and that was my interview with deanna riley daughter of lucinda hules i thank her for appearing on the program I also need to thank Anthony at crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. If you remember, he was my guest for the Tammy Leopard episode. He is the one who put me in contact with Deanna. Please check out Anthony's site. He's doing great work there. Last week, with the disappearances of Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman, we encountered a very rare kind of case. People who disappear after a fire. Very rare. This week... Lucinda's case is even rarer. In fact, it may be one of a kind, where somebody impersonates the person who disappeared and actually goes back to the family. Sure, ID theft of disappearance victims is fairly common, but somebody becoming the person and going back to the family? It doesn't seem possible, but it happened. And as Deanna explained, when everybody figured out who Amanda really was... It was like the family losing their mother, sister, wife all over again. And I thought Deanna was very frank how it affected her. And I thank her for her honesty. It's not easy to admit things like that in public. So I hope the listeners will reach out to her in the discussion group because she's a member there. To further illustrate how fragile Deanna's family was in 1992 or 1993 after Amanda was abruptly taken away, For a while, they actually believed that Amanda had been put into the witness protection program because maybe she might have known something about Lucinda's disappearance eight years earlier. And the graffiti and Amanda being run off the road were efforts by someone to keep her quiet. Yes, I know, all these years later, it may seem outrageous. And of course, Deanna now knows that that's not true because she's talked to Amanda recently. But at the time, given how Lucinda disappeared... Then Amanda disappeared just as mysteriously. You can understand why Deanna's family would have been very paranoid. As for what happened to Lucinda and why she disappeared, my suspicion is that her showing up with Linda and Nika might have led the men there to think the wrong thing about her. And then you add in that Larry Moore might have been running a prostitution ring through this cleaning business. Then eight years later, Linda and Nika don't pop back into Lucinda's life when she reappears. Of course, it wasn't Lucinda. And I can't help but think that Linda and Nika might have known that it wasn't Lucinda. Yes, it all seems very suspicious, but it's very possible that Linda, Nika, Larry Moore had nothing to do with Lucinda's disappearance. It's very possible. 
I have some other theories, but that's not really what I do here. I just want to present the facts to all of you and allow you to use your own minds to draw conclusions. So I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to iTunes, Podomatic, or Stitcher and give Unfound a five-star review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound. Thank you.